I'm waiting for Naman to introduce. Should I start? Yes, I guess uh, Naman, you can uh, initiate. Okay. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, a very good evening and welcome to this presentation by the Mishra Center. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Ellapulli Vasudevan. Uh, Vasu is uh, a PhD from Alto University. Uh, he has uh, a, 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 P a PGDM from IIM Indore and he is a BTEC from IIT Roorkee. Uh, before joining IIMA, uh, Vasu was with uh, ESCP Business School Paris. And um, we look forward to this uh, very interesting presentation by uh, Vasu. Now, uh, just some rules of the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, put them in the chat window. And I will uh, moderate those questions and present them uh, to Vasu. Okay. And uh, if possible, we can try to have a slightly more open QA after the end of the presentation. Vasu, is that fine? Yeah, it's perfectly fine. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So without much delay, I will hand over the reins to Vasu. Thank you, Naman. And uh, thank you, uh, Sanket and uh, Kapil, for putting this together and asking me to present this paper. So, uh, the background of this paper, uh, so it's with my uh, my co-author is Denise, uh, who is at uh, HK uh, University of Science and Technology uh, right now. Uh, we have a history. So uh, Denise was uh, graduating his PhD when I entered. So that's, uh, we're both from Alto University. So that's our connection. Uh, this paper is personal to both of us. Uh, it is sort of, uh, both were investment bankers at one point in time. We've both had experienced grueling work hours. Um, in my case, I probably was clocking close to 80 to 90 hours a week. And Denise has also put in similar uh, efforts in his earlier stage. Of course, we crossed that. Uh, we both came to academia uh, after our experience in investment bank. Uh, and uh, that's where we connect on this, uh, both ex-investment uh, bankers. And uh, as the title says, and... Uh, and the title is derived from a statement by David Solomon, uh, who says that, just remember, uh, if we all go an extra mile for our client, even when we feel that we are reaching our limits, it can really make a difference to our performance. Okay, so this is David Solomon uh, from Goldman Sachs, which sometimes in media is refers to, referred to as the vampire shark or vampire squid uh, institution. Okay, so... This guy emphasizes, clearly emphasizes that you better work hard. Okay, we are paying you a lot. You better work hard. And uh, let us let me introduce you to a very interesting uh, person um, in history. His name is Moritz Erhard. He's a German. He was working with the uh, Bank of uh, America right now. Nowadays called, not BOFA anymore. It is Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, BAML. He was an intern and uh, a typical intern, 21 year old guy trying to make his career. So let's try to look at what a typical intern as such goes through in an investment bank. Okay, so let me start uh, with a, uh, this is from a, not a, a newspaper, but it is a blog, which uh, typically captures what a day in a life of an intern is. And uh, so this is the story. You start at nine o'clock. Okay, you reach your office at nine o'clock and the first hour you're basically just going through uh, market uh, related uh, news. Your, uh, there may be some emails from your uh, analyst you are working with. You have to sort that out. Okay, and you start preparing uh, something about what the economy is going through. There will be some talks related to overall economy, international uh, centers, et cetera, et cetera. Right? At 10 o'clock, there is an internal meeting where you have to pitch in, you have to take notes of what is being discussed. It's most likely about a new pitch that, that they are going to make, can be about credit restructuring, it can be about an IPO or 
whatever that is. You better keep notes because anybody can come to ask you about it later. By 11 o'clock, he goes to the analyst with whom he is doing his internship and he will give him a new, a new uh, task. Okay, you have to prepare this bunch of slides uh, that we are going to use it for whatever was discussed in the meeting. Start preparing the slides, okay? Okay, so he'll give you some information. He will say that, okay, you can pick up information from here and here. 12.30, you start preparing, and by 12.30, you say, okay, it's lunchtime. Let me start having lunch, and this is something that you do with other interns, possibly. Most likely, you'll just go and get grab the lunch and come back to your seat, and that's that's a typical thing. 1, 1 p.m., the analyst sends, sends you a broad detail or uh, something. Okay, uh, now that you have thought about, collected the information, put it in this format or something, and then a uh, couple of hours, you are doing it. After that, Around three o'clock, you uh, sort of have your regular intern thing that they do, which is like, okay, take you through different uh, trading floor, uh, uh, introducing you to different trading floor because you are not being introduced to different kinds of businesses, streams or lines in an investment bank. 4 p.m., uh, or you can see that the trend, okay, that is constant work and your actual task, which as an intern is assigned at the beginning, you are able to come to that task only at 5 p.m., okay. So that's the grueling hour, but 7.30 p.m. you order dinner you, and have lunch, but the day doesn't end here, okay? That is the whole thing. 8 p.m., your analyst will send you other set of comments, okay? Uh, and he will ask you to implement them, major comments, and you send them, uh, send him that back, and by at 12 p.m., he will again give you some comments to sort of correct, okay? And send it for the tomorrow's internal meeting. So this is a typical day of an investment bank. So we are talking from 9 a.m. to 1, 1 a.m. the next day, completely busy, okay? Completely busy. This can break a lot of people. This, this kind of a life can completely break a lot of people, and that is exactly what happened with uh, Maurice Edhards. Uh, this, this chap, a 21-year-old, worked three days continuously for Bank of America and was found dead in his shower because of an epilept epileptic shock. Now, this is a tragic thing, okay? This is something serious. This, this aspect that the working culture is presenting is something serious. What was the reaction? Media uh, completely sort of, uh, uh, what do you say, annihilated a lot of banks because of their culture, okay? This is a, a report about, uh, uh, from CNBC, then we have, uh, other, so they direct relation, okay? The media caught hold of this and they really weren't good. They even likened it to slavery uh, that's going on in the in the city as the, as one of the independent in the UK voted. This is, of course, this incident happened in London, uh, but there are two main centers, so we will be talking about them. Uh, And again, uh, name calling, uh, spotlight on working culture of bank. Everybody knows that there, there are problems, and but uh, there was this serious, this event sort of like just opened up uh, uh, a box for, for the media to directly attack the banks. And uh, there was a call for a reform in some sense. Every newspaper, pretty much, you can see that every major newspaper, even the Guardian, is. Uh, sort of caught hold of this news and they they actually demanded whether there be government intervention or something from the bank. What did, what happened? Banks responded before the governments. They What they did is they, they said, okay, fine, we understand the problem. So what we are going to do is we are going to reserve the weekends. Okay, we are going to say, junior analysts, please don't come on weekends and we will come to what their weekends definition is, okay? So as, this, as I was saying, the vampire squid bank has been called since 2008. This was the initiator. Goldman Sachs comes in and says, you already see some incentive there, right? I think, why would they jump in and suddenly sort of say, uh, oh, we, we, are, oh, we understand the problem now. We are not asking people to not, not sort of, uh, don't come for work over the weekend. So Goldman Sachs and comes and says that, okay, we are making sure that junior bankers will not work on Saturday. They are not saying about anything about Sunday. So, but Saturday we are going to give them off. This followed. Bank of America came in. Uh, other banks uh, also jumped in the same bandwagon. J.P. Morgan, 
okay, Credit Suisse, and all of them just, just announced that we are going to give junior bankers and interns specifically some days off over the weekends, okay? Seven investment banks, top investment banks, now they, uh, why we are only looking at them is they pretty much cover the entire universe. They're, uh, the share of their deals is almost like uh, more than 95% or 98% at that time when this, this happened. So uh, seven investment banks explicitly announced that they are going to have a policy to protect workers, that is junior workers, no work on Saturday, similar policy. Two investment banks explicitly said, uh, I think Morgan Stanley openly said that, no, we are not going to do this. And uh, we, are, we might have a discussion on this, but uh, we don't have evidence why they opted for this, but there is some evidence. The targets were again, junior bankers who are new in the company, who can be forced to work forever for a very long time. That is the uh, policy. So let me uh, list the policies. So there are these seven banks, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Credit Suisse, Citibank, Barclays, and Deutsche Bank. They announced policies. And the policies, as you can see, uh, is on the rightmost side, is that Goldman Sachs says that, okay, you need not work from Friday 9 p.m. up until Sunday 9 a.m. Okay, this is uh, one reason uh, in subsequent uh, messages, which is not shown here, uh, the reason why they exclude most of the Sundays is that junior bankers, probably prefer to come on Sunday so that they can prepare something for the Monday meeting. They are required to do that and they do come in uh, on Sundays to sort of prepare uh, uh, either a pitch book or some information over the weekend for the Monday. So generally saying, if you look at the policies, the Saturdays are what are sort of left out. So uh, they say that, okay, junior bankers need not work on Saturdays. Morgan Stanley for that say uh, openly announced, UPS openly announced that no, we are not going to implement such a thing. We are happy. Uh, I, I don't, we don't think our bank, uh, junior bankers have this problem of 100 hours working, which may or may not be true. HSBC, again, there is no clear policy. They never announced it, never talked about this. HSBC more, is more on, le less on the investment banking side. It's more, mostly a commercial bank. So they, for them, it's not such a, uh, such a big deal. The other big ones, all of them are covered here. So these are the banks we are looking at. For us, these seven banks are the policy implementing banks, and these three banks serve us as, a, as our control for most of the analysis. So what do we do in this paper? We do is we analyze the effects of this policy, this particular policy, which is quite important for uh, in terms of the working hours, what happens to the working hours? And I'll come to that, what we do in this paper, which is quite uh, the, the, the whole essence or the proxy of this paper is what uh, makes this paper interesting. And second, we analyze is the quality of work, okay? So what we find, uh, just to summarize, what we are going to find is that, first thing is that as soon as the policy got implemented, in the policy bank, people shift their work from weekends to very late night hours on weekdays. So instead of working on a Saturday, you will find that people are working on Thursday at 2 a.m. or 10 a.m. or something of that sort of Wednesday uh, 10 to 4. That's the time where we really see the effect. And second is because of this, what happens is the quality of work actually goes down for this policy banks as measured by analyst reports that they uh, generate. So this is the gist of the paper. It's a short paper. It's not like complicated. We, we have done robustness, which, which I will discuss, but mainly these are the two things. But uh, let me put uh, the literature uh, where this paper fits in. First thing it fits in is the bank culture, which is first, uh, the, the Michael 2011 is a nine year ethnographic study because before this paper, uh, there is no empirical evidence on work banks, uh, bankers working hours. And the reason is very simple. You cannot go and ask uh, go Goldman Sachs, oh, why don't you give me your register of when did people come in and go out? Because that's the obvious case of, <laughs> uh, you can very easily uh, do a lot of, uh, what do you say, they will be violating some, I'm not sure whether they are. The, it, they would not give it because it might infringe, uh, in, infringe on labor laws or something of that sort. You cannot get those uh, that data set. That's why uh, this Michael 2011 is an ethnography. It says, interview conducted over a period of nine years in different sectors, different people, including law and uh, investment banks. And what they find, uh, he, he, what he reports is that 
uh, investment banker, especially junior bankers, work anywhere between 75 to 120 hours a week. Well, that's that's quite a lot. I mean, that's quite a lot. Celeriar uh, Vane is another paper on bank culture, but it mostly relates to uh, earnings of bankers. I think it, it relates to the fact that there is highly competitive uh, structure in banking. And even though they work very large um, number of hours, they are equivalently compensated. So, but the but here is compensation enough of uh, when when a life kind of a situation is coming along, then is such a, a grueling working hour just compensating uh, for it is enough or not is a big question out there, which is still debated. Second is the productivity and uh, the oldest uh, Feldstein uh, 1967 papers clearly says uh, it's old era. The idea was more the working hours, hence there will be more productivity. But uh, come come to uh, our era, which is 2015, uh, uh, Penkevel finds that that longer working hours can cause fatigue and productivity will decrease. And on those lines, uh, Hirschleifer et al. find that analyst forecasts, that is when analysts make forecasts, they make it at the end of the day, they tend to be really error prone. They tend to hurt more, they have more errors, and they just issue a number which is rounded out. Uh, those kind of things they find, uh, that is the fatigue is playing out uh, into their forecasts. And uh, the most interesting is the Spelsman 1977, where again, which we relate to, is the unintended consequence of a uh, regulation. So Pelsman paper is about the introduction of seat belts in the US. So immediately, as soon as the seat belts were introduced, so uh, the government were like, oh, look at the numbers. We have reduced the number of uh, car accidents and the number of deaths. But what he does is he looks at a uh, holistic picture. He looks at those, uh, not just the deaths of people in the car, but also pedestrians who got killed. So what he's saying is when, when you put a seat belt, uh, when you ask people to put seat belts, they start driving faster instead of, you know, the, there is a psychological thing that you will not be hurt. So you start driving faster. So there are more accidents which can possibly affect the other person. And because of this paper, there were other insurance schemes that made sure that uh, the person who is affected gets uh, hospitalized and that insurance is covered. This is a very uh, seminal paper. So we relate our paper to that in terms that just absolutely saying you cannot come and work on Saturday doesn't make any difference unless you change the whole culture completely. Uh, so we motivate our uh, motivate our empirical uh, structure through a model, which is a very uh, standard, simple model. So what we assume is, let us say there are two days of work, okay? An investment banker kind of a person has to finish a job in two days and uh, uh, she works, let us say, XTRs, X1 or X2. There are just two days here in this model. And the quality of output is given as Q, X1 plus X2. Okay, that is the total number of hours she has put in. Uh, Q here is a neoclassical neocl production function. And if uh, not many economists are uh, in the audience, it, we assume that it is concave. That's the main property that we require, that it is uh, concave. That is, as and when somebody puts in more efforts, of course, the quality goes up but at a diminishing rate. It increases at a diminishing rate. That's our main assumption here for the quality. We assume that the wages are well compensated. So whatever the quality is being produced, you are getting compensated. Now this can be assumed for uh, investment banks because you do get enough. There is no, uh, they clearly they are willing to pay money for more hours of work. Uh, so what we do is uh, uh, we, uh, we assume a cost function for each day of work. Okay, it can be different for both days, can be, we have taken it as different for both days, a cost function for X1 and X2. And X, X star denotes the optimal choice of hours, okay? Uh, what we do is uh, now we put in the constraint that on the second day, you can only work for X dash, some max bar X, X hours uh, on day two. And how does this, our main question is rather simple. Let's say X star is the optimal, value for these two days. X star and X star is what you're going to work. Some number that comes out as optimal, whatever given, the, we don't worry about the, uh, the nature of uh, the equation, but let's say you come up with a number, some number X star and some number X star on day one and day two. What happens when you restrict uh, the day two's work by reduce that work, like put a cap on the number of hours you can work on second day. And uh, for that, we have to optimize this uh, equation with a constraint that X2 is less than X bar, 
which is uh, uh, the uh, uh, constraint put on by this is similar as in to some extent you cannot work on uh, weekends let's put it this way not all the hours on weekend so uh, we, uh, we just uh, uh, in first order condition itself gives us the uh, main propositions of this model is that uh, we don't have to go into the details of it so essentially what we come up with is that x1 is greater than x star that is had had there been no policy on the first day, you would have been working less hours than the opt, uh, optimal optimal number of hours. Uh, and the second uh, the second cons constraint is binding in uh, in our case. And uh, x1 plus x2 is less than 2x1. So basically, you are overall working less hours. You are overall working less hours, and you end up working more on the first day. That is the thing. So basically, you are shifting work from the second day to the first day. And that's the proposition we are trying to. And overall productivity should also go down because uh, you know that the overall productivity is direct uh, quality function is a summation of these two, which has come down. And hence, uh, these are the two propositions. The quality should come down and basically you should be shifting work. So this, uh, if at all you have a concave uh, productivity function, that is whenever you keep working more hours, your productivity keeps, uh, it, uh, keeps reducing, uh, the rate of production keeps redu uh, reducing. So how, how do we uh, go about, uh, so first we analyze the uh, policy uh, on actual working hours, uh, which we infer of course, and then we look at the quality of the work. So this is again, as I had pointed out, there is no direct data. So you cannot go and ask, Goldman Sachs, give me the number of hours all your analysts have worked. Nobody can ask that, they will not release this data. So what do we do? We do a very clever thing, I think, uh, in this paper, that is what uh, got this. So what we look at is, we look at taxi rides starting from, so all these banks, one more reason why we chose these banks is all of them are uh, headquartered in New York, okay? And in 2016, New York, in a drive for open data access, released the data of all the taxi rides that have been taken by all people. Uh, the data starts at 2009 and it is available even up until now. The only thing uh, with the data is uh, till 2016, the exact GPS coordinates were available. So from 2009 to 2016, July, uh, the exact GPS coordinates of pickup location and drop off location were available. Since 2016, they have categorized it as zones. So up until 2016, uh, we can observe whether the taxi was taken at a bank site and whether it actually ended up in a residential address, okay? So in, in a whole, there are 1.1 billion taxi rides that we are dealing with in this, in this period, like starting from 2009 till July 2016, uh, there are 1.1 billion taxi rides that are available to us, but we are not looking at all the taxi, we are, we are not looking at what taxi rides uh, uh, people are taking. But uh, those of you who are interested in data uh, analysis, data science, it's a great data for like just, just to understand the life of New Yorkers. You will see on weekends where people are going for their shopping. You will see that uh, where there's the, uh, what happens in the morning hours from, uh, what do you say, airports to where do, they, where do people come in in the morning and where do they go? How, how uh, Manhattan is crowded in the, uh, morning hours and it becomes, so you can do a lot of things with that data. It's very powerful data. So uh, quite a lot of details about entire New York is available for other research purposes as well. Uh, so what we do is uh, we assess the working hours. What we do again, we, we have timestamp as well of the taxi ride. So timestamp, geographic location of taxi rides. So we are able to observe taxi rides being taken from the bank headquarters to the residential address at different points in time. Okay. And this gives us a somewhat not so clean of course uh, anybody can take i can I, uh, anybody can take a taxi ride from a bank location to the housing but over a period of six years we expect that the noise and across 10 banks the noise gets resolved and it uh, more or less gets resolved we see some trends which are uh, uh, which i'll show which are uh, very nice as well okay so these are the location this is lower manhattan uh, new york and these are the locations of the bank the gray ones are gray polygons so uh, I'll, I'll tell you what these are. Uh, so let's take Citibank for, uh, as an example. 
this is the site location. This is the Citibank's office building. And it has been slightly expanded uh, because we need to cover the roads. We cannot just take the building as the location from which. So we uh, slightly expanded by 100 feet to cover the road around Citibank. And this circle is a surrounding area, which is three times an area of the Citibank's building. What we do is there are some idiosyncratic aspects about taxi rides. You know? For example, uh, airports will obviously have far more taxi rides. Citibank's area will have far less taxi rides, while Deutsche Bank, which is an extreme lower Manhattan, there will be far more taxi rides. So by nature of the location, there are some idiosyncratic factors. And how we deal with it is we sort of look at the taxi rides from a bank location, which is in excess of its surrounding area. So what we do is we, we control for whatever traffic of that region, of that overall region is, with reference to another uh, uh, somewhat larger area, which is the surrounding area of the bank. And then we, inf and we see the changes in that particular variable, okay? So our analysis from 1 billion, when we look at only the taxi rides from uh, okay, bank locations to let's say uh, residential addresses, we have 16 million taxi rides. 10 large investment banks, nine, 2009 to 16. Uh, okay, so I have already made, uh, so, so to neutralize the uh, effects of idiosyncratic factors, uh, localized factors, we use uh, for each, uh, compare the, for each bank location, we compare the rights originating from the bank side with the rights originating from area nearby. Uh, so this is a typical map of uh, taxi rights at different, hours of the day throughout a week, okay? Uh, so starting from Monday, you can see there is a spike. There is again a spike around uh, later hours. And the uh, dark one is the banks. So you can see that banks are already having quite high traffic late night hours compared to its surroundings, where the dotted lines are surroundings. And you can see that the surroundings seems to have more taxi rides uh, compared to the banks during the weekends, okay? So this, is, this sort of is uh, somewhat comforting that this is what is the trend you should expect because uh, at the end of the day, uh, there are far more workers in bank and major, majorly the workers will take taxi and that's the trend that is. There is a peak around uh, post, uh, post lunch, which again is related to businesses. Uh, you have a question? Yes. Clarificatory question. Yes. So uh, the source is clear, but for the destination, are you using New York zoning map? Yes. It's called the, uh, the the data is coming from something called Pluto. They have another uh, zoning map, which uh, gives. So we uh, we use residential addresses not just in New York, also in New Jersey. Yeah, because as you know, most of the interns they cannot afford uh, all the locations in New York. So we combine New Jersey for the destination at least. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the way up till, till uh, there are some things going to Bronx and other areas as well, but uh, much less. Most of them are living. Actually, if you really look at internship period, most of the late night rides go to the university area because that's where these uh, interns tend to stay. Columbia. And Columbia and uh, just above the Hyde Park area. Of course. This is indeed very clever. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, that is, uh, so this is the variable that we are trying to focus on. This is average over all periods, but we are trying to look at the variation that happens before and after and for banks versus, so this is just an average. So what it shows is there is a peak for, this is bank minus surrounding. This is our variable of interest, controlling for the localized effects. And as you can see, there is a drop, drop in Saturday, Sunday and quite high peaks, much higher. That is, there is more rides from the bank during late night hours already, okay, in general in the data. But our question is, does it change? That is our main question. Does it change before and after policy? Uh, this is a general overview of the uh, uh, descriptive statistics, okay? So uh, generally you can see that the average rides from the bank sites and surroundings are very similar. Uh, tip percentages, again, someone wants to do a study, it is 19.18, but uh, as you can, it is, it's quite regularly a, rounded uh, number because obviously you'll either go for 20% or something. So, and uh, what else we can observe in this data is, yeah, it's typically the median number of people is just one. There is one guy taking a ride most of the times in the data set. Uh, all right, so, so here is our uh, first main result. So what we have here is the three explanatory variables, uh, which is an indicator variable for policy bank. Okay, so seven banks, 
with reference to the three banks. So three banks are zero. Post policy is a period. Whenever these people announced, a, uh, it's a slightly staggered, this data set. Uh, that's why whenever we put weak fixed effects, this doesn't go away. Uh, so ideally, if, if all of the policies were implemented at single date, then this post policy variable should go away when we have fixed effects. But it doesn't go away because we, the policies are implemented in a staggered manner, I think. Uh, so first was announced by Goldman Sachs, then the last one was announced by Deutsche Bank six months later close to April uh, 2014. That's, and most of the policies were close to 2014, uh, 2013 end and 2014 beginning. Uh, so our main variable of interest is policy bank cross post policy and the dependent variable is excess percentage of rights at particular hours uh, as measured as a percentage of the total rights in a week. Okay, so what we see as uh, main thing is for policy banks, after the policy, you can see that there is a drop in the Saturday rights. Now, uh, how we interpret this particular result is that the policies, as you would, would have noticed, for many banks, it's like it starts at 9 and goes on till, yeah. But on Friday, people will most likely hang around with without any notification. They might say that, oh, I'm going to a bar later on or something of that sort. So the, there you can see some lay, hangover effects coming up. Uh, because the policy gets implemented at a particular point, but people are probably staying. But our main variable of interest, or main main uh, uh, that is the main number of interest, is this one, which is uh, negative and quite significant. So what happens is after the policy, for the policy banks, the number of rights taken on Saturdays does go down. Okay, so the policy is sort of working. Okay, now let's look at what happens to the weekday weekday rights. Huh? So on the weekdays, late night hours. So we start from 6 p.m. And our interest is again this variable. So as you can see here, from 10 to 12 p.m. there is an increase in rights, strong increase in rights from 12 to 2 and 0.185. That's again a, a, a strong increase, very late night hour. I, I want to uh, take you back to what, uh, quickly take you back uh, to, one line which ended before, okay. So that is, yes, so the, it's going till four. Yes, that's what we are finding. And more importantly, uh, as you can see, this is one more thing that interns would stay uh, uh, for longer time because they, the taxi rides can be expensed. Okay, so they can, they will take a taxi if they are sitting more after 10 o'clock. After 10 o'clock, the taxi rides are expensive. This is applicable for junior bankers as well as for interns. So you will generally, as there are many uh, anecdotal reports, you will generally see a line of people coming exactly at 10, 10 p.m. out of the banks. Because after that, any ride you take, taxi ride you take, will be reimbursed. So we can be, sh we can be somewhat sure that whatever these taxi rides are happening at late night hours are actually investment bankers. They are not just random people. They are more likely to be investment bankers because there is an incentive associated with it to be. Uh... Yeah. Oh, oh. So, um, yeah. I think it, lo uh, it looks like a classic uh, difference in differences uh, yeah. specification, right? Yes. yes. Uh, so, so to some extent, is it D and D and D uh, to be more precise because of the but yeah, uh, please go ahead with the question. Yeah, no, no. Uh, yeah, it's a difference in different setting. Actually, it's D and uh, D I D I D because. But what we do is the first difference we take at the y variable level itself, which is controlling for the localized effects instead of. Uh, so we can we could also do this in another way. Is that we can actually throw in a variable for policy bank compared to surrounding. But it was becoming too hard for anybody to interpret. So we we sort of did it at the uh, y variable level. Uh, which was more accept, which seems to be more accepted in the literature uh, than the uh, DND and D, uh, DIDID, which becomes very difficult to interpret. Yeah. So there is an assumption in DID called uh, parallel trends assumption, right? Between yeah. the policy yeah. banks and right. the non-policy right. banks. Uh, so uh, I, I can't show you in this presentation, but we do have, uh, well, this was a question asked by the referee as well. So... Yeah, so uh, I need to show the exact uh, parallel trend thing that we had uh, in the paper. 
So this is what the thing was. Okay, so this uh, chart shows the trend. So this is the policy implementation date. This line represents the non-policy banks, and this line represents the policy banks. So you can see a structural break here, and it, uh, we control for this trend by using uh, year week fixed effect. So the trend is generally gone. So when you look at the trend, uh, this is just an aggregate number, but you can see that there is a structural change right after the policy, and they are more or less parallel to some extent. So the parallel, ideally, uh, if uh, without anything, we would have wanted this to be parallel to this and continued, but we use uh, the uh, weak fix effects to take care of that. Yes. This staggered DID, right? Yeah. So your control group keep changing. Basically, your treatment group keeps changing. Like first of the bank implemented this in November, mm -hmm. right? So at that point of time, that's your treatment group. Yes. But later, your treatment group gets added because the other uh, yeah, bank yeah. is also getting sure. introduced. And I sure. think there is a recent JFE article which talks about that there is this problem in staggered it depends. Actually, uh, the problem here is not that large because see. Uh, since uh, the first one was Goldman Sachs, it implemented in September, November, I think. Uh, and by January, six out of these seven banks are done. So within three months, so the time period we are looking at is six years, yeah. and uh, it is almost from a week. The number of weeks point of view, it is just like uh, ten weeks time. For okay. uh, so, uh, we can even exclude that thing that does doesn't change anything. So we can just remove uh, yeah. from start to end. Uh, we just kept it uh, because we want uh, let, let there be data. This is uh, this is not a concern. This is not a concern for us. When the staggered thing happens over an entire period of the sample, mm. then it becomes a big problem. Okay, you know. Okay. So uh, your first treatment happens at the beginning of the sample, and then your last treatment happens almost at the close. Mm. Then you have an issue, right? Okay. Then you have a massive issue with treat, uh, clubbing them as a mm. treatment, and because the one of them is switches from treatment to uh, the other one. Okay. Yeah, but here it is not a problem because everything uh, you can almost say that everything happens in a span of four months. All the regulations. Okay, just second question. Uh, you have the context context of New York, so people do not use their own vehicle there. No, uh, they would be using. Uh, we are not denying that, but uh, okay. the billionaires will do. I think we are we are primarily thinking. Uh, think of a junior banker who gets reimbursed. We are trying to capture his taxi rides. Okay. You, you need a chauffeur in New York, right? Otherwise, the parking will be more expensive than the car, so no one drives. <laughs> so, <right>. anyways, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, yes. now, now, this is already published, so yeah. uh, congratulations on that. Yeah, I, I may have some ideas on follow up works on this. For example, um, different banks would have different status, some of them will mm -hmm. only attract, uh, let's say, Columbia MBAs, mm -hmm. others will only attract, you know. NYU, some yeah. others may attract Harvard and Sloan. Mm -hmm. So um, that would also differentiate where they live. So many of them would live close to, let's say, right across the river in Jersey City. Right. Whereas yeah. lesser paid uh, inter um, could yeah. go all the way up to, as you said, you know, Hoboken and yeah, yeah, further north. Yes. Yes. And they like when we look at the descriptive statistics here, the maximum taxi ride is around four miles. Ah, two right. two and two point eight miles is so the average. Are, yeah, the maximum probably. Right. Yeah, right. So we are essentially talking about people who are using taxi ride for commute. Right. There may be a large number of people who take path train all the way to New Jersey. True. True. Uh, especially the lesser paid ones. Right. Right. Uh, and many of them would go to let's say up up. New York, whatever you call it. Right, right. So uh, maybe the results would be different if you simply segregate these investment banks uh, across their status. Uh, uh, so, and so, also uh, include yeah. data on, let's say, path or yeah. uh, that should be available. Yeah, you, uh, you're right. I think uh, that, that there is a possibility that, uh, the, but somewhat comforting is that actually the control group also has big banks. Uh, so we are controlling for the yeah, bank. Uh, so Morgan Stanley is quite big, and uh, so uh, so is UBS. So we have big banks which can, uh, like Morgan Stanley, would pay pretty much similar to Goldman Sachs. So we have control, and we are uh, somewhat. Uh, of course, we cannot address the aspect that people are taking. Uh, it's, it's a follow-up idea. Yeah, it's a follow-up idea. So we can explore that. Honestly, we can explore that. And Thank you. Secondly, the seasonality. Mm -hmm. So you are taking uh, pan year data, but 
but no so uh, for be seasonal no, no our uh, y variable is percentage of ride at a particular hour in oh, a week okay, yeah. in, in a week, week. Mm-hmm. in a week so the number of each observation is bank week mm-hmm. so bank week hour as in week hour so uh, the seasonality aspects uh, so well, of course concern what i'm saying is that uh, in certain seasons this result would be stronger than in some other seasons yes we are coming to that okay. one season particular of interest to us is <laughs> okay so uh, this is the result so change in taxi ride so i'll quickly go we have like 20 minutes yes uh internships yes uh, so i am just generally uh, thinking about this that why uh, why can't they like in, it's a it's a cultural question so like why can't they go back home and work on because like as far as you can have seen the day of the internship as you have presented mm-hmm. the late night works are basically correcting on their ppts and stuff so okay let, me, uh, let yeah. me answer that with a very simple you want your manager to see that you are working Okay, so the so the managers are also technically. Of course, involved. the the analysts who are just above you, they will be working till the same time as you. As in, as they say, you better hang your coat even if you are going for a, <laughs> a short break. So uh, the thing is that the signaling is the main thing here. Whether you are working or not, or you are productively working or not, is less of a concern. And more importantly, it's such a competitive environment. Let us say we both are interns. You are sitting till one a.m. Why can I go back home and work from home? i would want to signal that i am better than you right so there is this, this massive competitive signaling which works uh, to keep them in the office of course our data ends in 2016 it will be very interesting to study what happens uh, post covid but unfortunately there is no pinpointed location data understand because covid actually changed a lot of things as in covid made people aware of uh, the uh, that you can work from home and that is monitoring also can be done from home sort of so that changed the thing so that would be an interesting thing to study maybe follow up yes last year uh, intro to your results the signaling mechanism how does that conform to the quality result that you find uh if if it is truly signaling that is making people work then i would not expect to see no, so uh, we we understand that the policy particularly so first of all interns are not going to do uh, interns are not expected to issue and they will not be doing it is earnings per share outcomes so when we are talking about uh, analyst uh, earnings per share we are talking about those guys who are working till late uh, as a mid somewhat slightly above the intern level and who are working so they are less likely to signal they huh, are less likely okay. to be constrained about signaling so there is a productivity sort of explanation as far as the analysts go yes okay so then her question still so why is the analyst there no analyst actually i mean, <laughs> I, mean I, I thought i thought this i mean this question was coming in my mind also i thought this is sort of something with the you know investment bank confidential data etc you can't take stuff out maybe that was the reason but, yeah, but in general there is a signaling aspect to staying at the office and second thing is whatever you can do there is also an advantage of where you are located let's say you are an analyst you have four screens in front of you which you need not won't be able to set up you have a bloomberg terminal in front of you there are other things associated with it but i gave a, a signaling as the most basic case that it does definitely as a human character it happens but for the junior for the most junior ones for the interns but even for analysts it's uh, like if you look at the analysts they would if at all they want to issue a uh, uh what do you say a forecast they would rather be sitting at the office okay maybe last I'm... one question in the chat window also if you could quickly yes yeah. could you explain why you use policy banks as a separate variable would a bank independent post policy binary variable serve the same purpose uh we are we want to uh, understand the effect of the policy that is why we use this dependent uh, method it has to change for the policy bank after the policy if we had just understood if we just wanted to see whether in general it changes then uh, th- there is possibly there is possibly no story here so uh, our aim is to understand whether policy banks differed from non policy banks after the policy i hope that answer yes uh, you are yeah so the other i mean um, you do have some other, look like you have some other variables 
along with taxi rides where they're going like where they how much tip they how much they're tipping all of that yes i mean i'm just is there some kind of adverse selection that starts happening i mean the type of people working in these banks um especially across these banks mm-hmm. because of the policy i mean does that start shifting i mean is there some way to examine that because oh. because the results i mean again you know since preempting it a little bit you right. know in terms of quality etc right could there be sort of a adverse uh, selection explanation there uh so the people change people change people changed uh, uh so we have addressed that as one possible way uh in self selection issue when it comes to quality mm-hmm. uh quality example in this case it's very difficult to address because the thing is that we do not really observe it's the same person before or after or who is the new person coming in we just observe the taxi we don't know who is taking the taxi ride right but i'm just but wondering just, yeah the, no i mean if uh, it yes was, yes of course uh, the, the you know whether using i don't know what it really conveys but and whether there is enough variation in terms of sort of percentage tipping right. or usage of th- those are the other two variables yes. you had i don't know if there's something else yeah so maybe the main uh, numerical variable available uh-huh. uh, distance tip amount paid distance traveled uh, or location these are the available i mean maybe even location could give you some measure of sort of type of person i don't know because there are i mean there are i mean new york yeah, is pretty segregated that could could have been explored uh, we didn't explore that but there is definitely higher tipping by the bankers compared to the outside area that is there and what is the tipping rates come uh, uh, across more, these uh, policy bank and non policy banks and how does that, that change that we everything? haven't looked at yes that we haven't looked at so i think I that think, might give us some information i feel okay about the type type of, of the ban- oh, okay. the type of the individual like whether that is shifting the trans question as well like where are they staying uh, and uh, is there a difference in their income which l- results in uh, a difference in sort of year so from zero for example you can get like you know the code level pension rate and that mm-hmm. and you know one challenge could be if the if they switch from lower quality housing to higher quality housing and that's the kind of thing that is done right about. but otherwise i mean these mbas will always be too greedy not to kill for an investment banking job no, no, so that is not going to change no, but this is and the concern here is because you are giving the bid the policy bank who is in a policy bank that is not so whether people are concerned because you can't come in on weekends or whatever mm-hmm. therefore i start moving to one type of bank do i move to morgan stanley because yes. i yeah. you know so 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 one is sort of yeah what's happening in the working all of that you could have quantified that. yeah you're yeah. right we could have quantified in terms of let's say if there is a nature tipping nature being changing mm-hmm. because but we are limited with the number of variables see uh, at least for this part for the second part the quality part we address it okay for the quality part we absolutely can observe when one person shift from one one bank to another so we eliminate those cases and for our, for our results like it should not be self selection right the policy comes in mm-hmm. and i switch from this bank right. to just because i like uh working late night hours instead of working on the weekend right. i would prefer to work in a policy bank mm-hmm. but we eliminate those cases and okay. still find the results at least for the quality part okay. for this we are uh, uh, we cannot say that okay somebody's tipping should go up we don't have a direct hypothesis mm-hmm. on uh, what tipping self selection uh, how self selection could uh, possibly uh, affect so we didn't we couldn't uh, but it's an interesting thought though maybe i'll check it up later <laughs> uh okay uh second uh, what we do is we have okay so one more result which i wanted to show quickly is that uh, we also look at what happens not particularly seasonal but what happens exactly at the internship weeks okay what how does the shift so we interact one more variable called the internship week which is typically from week 23 to week 32 out of 1 to 52 uh, is the week where typically it starts mid june ends in early august or something and that's where actually it's almost at the end where moritz sort of uh, ended up uh, having his uh, epileptic attack so what we look at is this intern variable takes a value of 1 for weeks which are internship weeks 23 to 32 again you see the shifting is stark much stronger than uh, the other cases and uh, uh, again we see that the 10 to 2 uh, it's very strong uh, so uh so what what we infer is the effects of this policy are much stronger the shifting essentially uh, essentially is much stronger for uh 
policy, uh, sorry, especially the intern when the interns are working. So, Vasu, can I ask another question? Yes. How do we? How is the policy actually enforced? Um, yeah, uh, that's that's a very interesting question. Uh, so, uh, this is precisely why we have a very long data set instead of looking at a very short period. Now, this is a self-proclaimed policy, and the only way one can think about this getting uh, implemented if there is a reputation loss of not not implementing it. Because I am a bank, I'm I'm a profit making entity. I say that oh my juniors are not going to come and work, but we have anecdotal evidence of this uh, from newspaper articles that this was implemented earlier on. So, so the, again, the the alternate sort of explanation that I'm thinking of is what if one mechanism of enforcement is hey we will not reimburse your taxi rides on weekends. And therefore, even though people continue to come, but huh. they don't take taxis. You're, you're, uh, you're actually right. That's exactly what happened later on. This is exactly what happened. They stopped reimbursing their meal coupons hmm. on Saturdays to right. implement it. And maybe they didn't also reimburse taxis. So I see I see this drop in terms of taking taxi rides, but now people are using the metro or, you know, But one subway. can still infer that the uh, taxi rides are being taken much later in the hour. So we are not, hmm. uh, so that still is happening. Right. So they are working much longer hours on weekdays. Because that's not changed. That's, the, that, that reimbursement. Changed. Yeah, yeah, so the reimbursement they did implement. So there is a, a clean, uh, there is a newspaper article which says that this is what, this is how they implemented. They stopped giving meal coupons on Saturdays, stopped uh, reimbursing. Pro I don't know about the taxi ride reimbursement on Saturdays though, but they said that you can't have meal coupons on Saturday. So that is a clear way to implement it. Then you need to be really uh, brave to take the scale in New York at 10 a.m. <laughs> Maybe that's true. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's go to the next part, which is about quality. So we look at two particular variables of quality and uh, forecast, analyst forecast being a very individual and most widely uh, available quality measure. So what we do is we measure something called forecast error, which is Let's say an analyst makes a EPS forecast. Uh, let's say it's March ending, a quarterly forecast. So March ending forecast is what we are looking. So analyst makes a forecast, let's say in January. Uh, so the forecast value minus the actual absolute or absolute value of this divided by the price of the stock. So as to make it comparable across uh, firms. The second variable we look at, which again relates to errors, is herding forecast. Now, uh, herding forecast is defined in literature as, let us say I make a forecast for a quarter ending March in January. I might more closer to the date, I'll make another forecast. Now, the question is whether I make that forecast between my previous forecast and the average forecast of all other analysts, then it is called moving towards the consensus. And if it is not, then it is moving away from the consensus. So uh, I made a forecast in January, I make another forecast in February. At February, the average was something. Do I move from my previous forecast towards the uh, consensus? Then it is herding forecast. If it is not, then it is not herding forecast. <clears throat> and this is quite standard definition. Both of them are very standard. So uh, in the analyst forecast literature document. So what we find essentially is this. Now, uh, policy, po same variables, explanatory variables, uh, somewhat different controls because we have to control for analyst fixed effects here as well. Uh, Policy bank, uh, cross post policy, what we see is after the policy, the errors increased. This is the absolute error we are talking about. And uh, this is the herd, herding behavior. And uh, again, this goes up. Uh, like we see 2%. This can be interpreted simply in terms of percentages. Uh, interpretation of this is with reference to average. Uh, so it's close to 11, 12% uh, across the models. Uh, so again, this this comes to the question that uh, uh, Ankur was asking. We had the uh, year week, which is small, smaller than that. Year week, yes. So that is uh, year week, which is lower than that. So obviously, it's. Because we last time, I less feature in the. Here, there are more fixed effects. Actually, there are uh, analyst fixed effects. There we cannot. Uh, Vasu, can they use the microphone to talk, please? Uh, people are not, not you, the question. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so let me repeat the question. The question was like uh, uh, the R squares are here are higher than the previous one, but here we have more fixed effects to control for. And these are taken from standard analyst uh, forecast literature. So we didn't do anything, so just followed them. We just looked at uh, uh, classical papers on this and just uh, used them. Okay, so uh, this uh, now I come to the qu uh, question that uh, Ankur was asking is that uh, what happens, you know, like now we are looking at this analyst forecast, but analysts can choose to work in a bank where there is, let's say, weekends off. Okay, so they might make a choice that, uh, or they might shift their job. Okay, so what we do is we address this by, uh, in our sample, actually, surprisingly, there are very few in the six years. We have 7,000 analysts, but uh, some 830 analysts move from, uh, move their jobs, like one, one, one seventh of them. But luckily for us, only 143 of them switch their jobs uh, from policy bank to non-policy bank. So that is what our main concern is. Okay, our concern is that if this guy moves from policy bank based on choice to a non-policy bank, and that we address uh, by eliminating, we also uh, eliminate uh, new hires. We also eliminate anybody who is making a uh, earnings forecast after the policy. Like if they start uh, issuing policies right after, they might have self chosen themselves into a particular kind of banking. So we eliminate those and the results are still still hold. Uh, I think there is hardly any difference except for slight drop in the statistical significance, but still very high. It's like uh, these are double, double star here is 99%. So uh, again, we see the same effects on the herding variable. So uh, and, and we ask another question here is, who gets affected the most? Whose quality is dropping the most? So in terms of uh, bankers, what we do is we define bank, uh, this analyst as junior analyst, as those who have less than two years of issuing uh, experience, issuing a, um, a, a sort of a EPS forecast and two to five years and more than five. So you see that, uh, so the uh, white bar here is forecast error. And this is the bar for the interaction effect. Uh, this is just capturing this value. Uh, this particular interaction term and, and the white bar is for forecast error and the gray bar is for herding error. So as you can say, the main effects are coming from junior bankers. So it seems that the policy similar to the one, what we saw in the internship period, the shifting was the highest here. Uh, the junior banker seems to be the most affected. So uh, the policies seems to have worked. Yes. It's reduced the job uh, during, uh, uh, I think I'm right on time. So uh, it reduced the work hours on Saturdays, but it increased the work hours on weekdays. As a result, the quality of work goes down for this policy bank after the policy. So what we, ha uh, what we say is that it, uh, you cannot change a bank's culture. Well, too many variables, including incentives, bonuses, signaling, possibly uh, better equipment. And there are too many things in there that you just cannot say, oh, work less on these particular days. It has its repercussions. And... Uh, and we find that this policy adversely affected the junior bankers who were supposed to be the ones uh, for whom the policy was intended. So they are working far, far more hours on weekdays uh, than they would have if the policy was not there. So that's, that's the paper. Uh, happy to take any questions. About causality, I have a question. Uh, we only know the policy banks uh, people are making mistake, but we don't know if these are the people who work late, right? You can't ask who worked late. Yes, that that relation so cannot how, be made. So you are making so there's no causality, right? Uh, the cause. So uh, this is not a causal paper in, in the in a sense that what we are looking at is the effect of the policy. The effect of the policy results in uh, higher working hours on uh, big days. And the effect of the policy results in higher, lower quality of work. Now, it is an inference that they are related. It's an inference they are related. And this flows from the model as well. If you have concavity of uh, working hours, we cannot observe because taxi rides are being taken. We don't know the identity of the person who is taking the taxi. So we just know the location from where it is going. But it is flowing this way. Policy, a higher work, policy, lower quality. That's the whole paper. Actually, we are not arguing that because somebody is working higher, that we cannot observe that. We can infer that from the results. Uh, oh, there is a question. There is one here. 
Uh, so it's chat. Oh, okay, that's, uh, is there any carpooling in uh, NIC? Uh, uh, okay, so uh, the, uh, there would be carpooling for coming in. For going out, uh, we we had this question asked to us. Uh, but uh, for most of the time, since you are getting reimbursed, you would rather take uh, a single taxi, and that's that's pretty much what we observe. Fifty percent of the rides from both surround uh, that the banking areas and surroundings have just one person. So uh, it doesn't look like carpooling is such a maybe for incoming uh, rides. We are just looking at outgoing rides. For incoming rides, there might be carpooling. And even if it is carpooling, I'm not sure whether you'll be taking a taxi. One of them would be the owner of the taxi. So uh, we can't observe that right now. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll so it's a question about a hypothesis and a proxy as such. So like uh, you, have, you have like as far as I'm seeing the data, the proxy is very well justified. So uh, and you've got significant results. So what if you hadn't gotten significant results in this study? Like so, I mean, like if you had uh, would you have thought of changing the proxy, I mean, like my question is, what does the null hypothesis explain in this question? The null hypothesis is that the policy doesn't have any effect. Both the like what? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right? So null hypothesis says policy has no effects. Even if you had negative effects, okay, the other way around, then the thing is that people, they have not implemented the policy very well. Let us say mm -hmm. that on Saturdays, the start, ride starts increasing. That means that's a very clear case. You should go and tell the newspaper guys that, okay, they had said this policy was implemented. It seems they are implementing the policy. Okay, so the newspaper guys are happy. The only thing is what is consequence of that policy is people are working late night hours. So we first started looking at how the policy got changed. Then we started looking at other implications of those. And uh, uh, so the, uh, this is how our research develops. The questions, uh, you look at the data and then you decide how, how things you're going to develop. Now, <laughs> I don't have a clear answer about uh, the data is large. The collection of data is not in our hands. It's a it's a population data almost, so it's not such an issue. The issue comes in when uh, you try to hand collect data or do surveys, and then it fails. Then the, that question is far more difficult to answer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if you can see this, the quality, I mean, you know, the banks are sort of, by an evolutionary sense, they should be the first ones to be able to see this. Right. And they should have course corrected, right? I mean, yeah, I'm, right. I'm yeah. saying, yeah, then this tells us a little bit about investment banks also. Right. Because you are saying that, look, there is a sharp decline in quality. Yeah. Um, so these, uh, these guys are closest to the market. So I think uh, uh, you're right. I think 10% uh, increase, whether it is significant for a bank to make a, uh, de like there is an increase of 10% in error. For a, from a researcher point of view, we are linking it to uh, the fact that the policy had a negative effect. From a bank's point of view, 10% might be just a small thing for them not to change anything. Economically, mm -hmm. so whether whether changing or uh, an announced policy, now you can even come and work on Saturdays, don't work too late and don't issue too many uh, forecasts uh, or working late in the night. I don't know. It's I, mean, I, I don't know. So, <laughs> you know the culture better. I mean, I thought they chased every cent. Right. So, I mean... So this 10%, is it, I mean, 10% in other contexts is usually, you know, not, is not trivial. In, yeah, it's not trivial. That's correct. Uh -huh. That's uh, that's absolutely uh, right. But uh, the question is that the, what is an academically established error rate versus what their clients think is the error rate is completely different. So what they are able, they will keep doing their business about, we, we have made this estimate and uh, they don't give any background data. They don't give any other analyst data. Now, if the client who is getting this analyst report is able to make out, yes, this actually there was an error last time. It has gone up since the policy. Now, if they are able to, the only then I think they will change their. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is academics look at error differently compared to what the clients or the bank looks at errors as. It might be that a certain numbers uh, are getting issued more towards the consensus because that's what the banks, banks want. That could also be a thing. So uh, I really don't know. I think it's very hard to say are too many moving parts. But like this, this is also about the uh, competitiveness amongst the uh, amongst the banks, right? 
competitiveness amongst uh, so one in general about uh, uh, factoid from the literature is that over time yeah okay sorry one uh, general factoid i'm sorry uh, so one general factoid about the analyst forecast literature is that in general errors have increased over time because there are more players uh, there is uh, the consensus is getting here and there most of the times and people are the juniors uh, or the newer ones tend to chase uh, these we have analyst fixed effects but juniors do tend to chase the consensus and uh, in general the error rates have gone up uh, in terms of analyst forecast now that might also be one of the reasons that uh, a 10 percent increase might not be the bank would be looking at it like okay everyone is uh, has an increase somewhere but we are looking at it from the perspective of just this policy and this period but in general over time the errors have gone up in terms of analyst forecast if we measure it the way we are doing that is actual minus the sorry uh, estimate minus actual absolute of that divided by the price yeah. uh to some extent yes it's not very clean in that because we throw in the, uh, there are two see the uh, parallel trend assumption uh, if you are looking at the errors of this regressions which is because there is a lot of fixed fixed effects here so the clean analyst error which is so number of things happens with analyst forecast error one is the timing one of the variables is the length the january uh, estimate uh, for a february uh, march ending is generally has a higher error than a february one so we need to have a, a, a analyst fixed effects to compare these two right so without fixed effects you cannot uh, generate a parallel uh, you cannot understand the trends what i'm trying to say okay you would just throw in the data of errors you you will not see a parallel trend uh, there unless you control for the fixed effects and once you control for fixed effects then you are comparing just the errors and errors seem to be having this effects which is visible yeah sir uh, my question is how do you identify mm -hmm. the people uh, from the banks uh, particularly the interns who are taking the taxi if that bank is located in a crowded area now i we don't identify interns we just identify taxi rides so we have we have no way of identify saying that this particular intern or anybody took the taxi we just assume that since it is in a periphery of 100 feet uh, there is a typical length of the road around the bank it must be somebody from bank employee and most likely the late night hour uh, taxis are going to be investment bankers because most of the administrative work gets over because normal banking function gets over by six you see a spike actually right after six from this banking location and then again a spike or later on in the night so we cannot say that this intern took it but we infer that it must be or not intern but juniors or those who can get reimbursement or those who do not own a vehicle, which typically are juniors compared to <laughs> others. Yeah. So Vasu, it's uh, 10 minutes past six. Yes. So last questions and then we'll end the seminar. But before that, thank you very much for presenting this interesting paper. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, do we have, yes. So we can take one question and we have to end the seminar. Uh, let's we can take uh, your question uh, we can continue for the audience people in the audience we can continue offline once everything ends yeah sure sure mm -hmm. yes can i ask him? okay sir what i believe like uh, instead of uh, like considering considering the taxi rides data so if we like though it was very difficult to collect the data individually we surveyed the people like the individually we uh, filled the questionnaire interview the interview the like uh, interns so what I believe the results will be more like varied as compared to the results shown because like so that we can know the exact like problems what they are like facing um, after the implementation of the policy or before the implementation of the policy. If we in individually interviewed or surveyed the young interns who are working over there. Yeah, you can. But uh, uh, the question is how, ma how many of them are going to reveal exact uh, uh, the question have to be designed. and. Uh, of course, uh, that's another project. So what we are doing is we are trying to infer directly from what they are doing instead of uh, actually asking them because that's they have their own incentives to answer that may not align with the interests of truthfulness, honestly, <laughs> many a times. I know Finance General would never publish that. <laughs> Thanks for answering <laughs> in a different way. Good, so uh, I think, uh, 
we are done we can close the webinar yes yes